Hey guys, Firebat here, bringing you the One Night in Karazhan card review number one of what cards we've seen so far released. We've kind of not seen much. We just saw the uh, the video with Ben Brode talking about the new cards and Frodan and TJ kind of commentating on them at uh, 2 a.m. And it's been about an hour now, so I haven't had too much time to let the cards soak in, but I do have some ideas about the cards, and I wanted to just, while it's still hot and fresh, review the cards for you. So let's get right into it. First up, we have Ivory Knight. So this is a 6-mana Paladin-only card. It's a 4-4 in stats, and it has Battlecry. Discover a spell. Restore health to your hero equal to its cost. So looking at this card, first thing that comes to mind for me is what are the odds you find a specific spell you want? And currently in the game, you know, this is going to change as cards get added because we are in the process of releasing an expansion. But currently in the game, you got about 11% chance to get a specific spell that you want, which is pretty good. What does that factor in? Things that are important there? You gotta think about like board clears. In your control paladin deck, you're gonna be wanting to get like uh, Consecrate, Equality, Enter the Coliseum, Avenging Wrath. So that's four board clear spells and it's a discover. You got 11% chance to get any of those individually. So you got some pretty good odds there of actually finding an AoE sweeper at the stage in the game, increasing, you know, the odds of having those in your paladin deck and also just getting a second of quality is insane you have some pretty good odds of finding a healing spell in, like aside from the fact of the card actually healing you you could also then get forbidden healing potentially or uh holy light lay on hands and then you got the factor of your percent chance to get a draw card in there so 11 percent chance per the only draw cards in paladin are really lay on hands and uh the five mana draw too so you got Decent options to be able to pick and choose between draw, clear, and heal with this card, which is pretty solid. And also, you know, secrets to some extent could be useful, but I, I doubt secrets are going to be great for, like, tempo. It's more of the, the control theme that you're going to see this card in. And now going into the actual effect of the, the card of, like, the restoring health to your hero. The average heal is three. So on average, you're going to be healing for three with this card. But then when you look at that, that sounds terrible. But it's also a discover. So there's a lot of variance with that three when you, you got to think about that as well as uh, the variance between the card costs themselves. You got uh, 11 cards, I think it was, at mana cost one for Paladin. So that really lows down the average. And then at the same time, you got any fin at 10 and land hands at eight, which bring the average way up. And then you got a few sixes in there, a few fives, a, a few fours. But it's mainly like the one costing is the most common card you'll see. And so then the average comes out to about three heal. But... The card's not being played for the, uh, the... The restore health to your hero is honestly just like a bonus on the, the side of the card. The, the real purpose of the card is for sure going to be the discover, allowing you to add extra board control tools to your control paladin deck. Because you're not going to play this in an aggro deck. Its stats are terrible for its cost. But its ability to discover you a card that then you can play to help control the board, draw cards, or heal is actually extremely powerful. I think this card is probably going to see play. I think it's on the lower end, if it does see play, of, you know, like, stellar cards. But it, it's kind of comparable to an Azur Drake a little bit, which then just also has that bonus of occasionally drawing you uh, the specific spell that you need for the situation, as well as not dying in fatigue because you're not drawing a card from your deck, you're creating a card from uh, the Discover effect. So I think overall, a pretty good card. Not not an amazing auto-include card by any means, but I think the card will see play. I think it'll be pretty solid. So moving right on up. Next up we have Kindly Grandmother. So this is a 2-mana 1-1 one, one Hunter card. It's a beast, and its death rattle is summon a 3-2 Big Bad Wolf, which is also a beast. So two beasts in one, and it's a death rattle that summons a bigger minion, so you can kind of compare that a little bit to Nerubian Egg, which in the past was... An insanely strong card. It saw most of its shine and its highlight in Zoo, not in Hunter, but uh, Zoo at this point is a deck, especially the hybrid versions of uh, Hunter, that uh, buffs smaller minions and usually runs Direwolf Alpha, Abusive Sergeants, those sort of things in the hybrid version. So I could definitely see this card being extremely powerful for Hunter. It's Hunter's biggest weakness in Whispers of the Old Gods meta has been its lack of early game. And of the early game cards, especially on the two-drop slot, I'd say this is one of the best two-drops currently in Whispers of the Old Gods because the two-drop slot is so bad. Many of the two-drop minions that are seeing play in competitive right now are just two-mana three-twos with some mediocre effect, like Huge Toad, for example, is a two-mana three-two, which then Death Rattle deal one damage to a random minion. It's like it's an awful effect compared to the two-drops of the past in... Uh, 
uh, Nax Ramus meta, for example, you had Haunted Creeper, which was just nuts. And this card's kind of like Haunted Creeper. You get a 3-2 instead of two one ones, but the Aftermath is also a beast, which is a, a leg up as well. So I, I think it helps Hunter a lot, and it helps them especially in their worst matchup, which is Zoo. Zoo being one of traditionally mid-range Hunters and even Hybrid Hunters' worst matchup in the entire game. Now you have a little bit more breathing room in that matchup, and you know one good card in the matchup could actually bring the percentage up a little bit because it's going to affect it more than it would affect you know a mediocre matchup or like a medium matchup because it's going to go from like super bad to just bad right and then that could swing the actual matchups of the deck enough to make the deck you know go from tier two to tier one so i think this is crazy strong in hunter as it stands gotta see what, what other cards come out but i think this will definitely see play i think it'll be a staple card in hunter and do a lot of work and you just look at the synergies here you got synergy direwolf alpha abusive sergeant hound master hunter's mark it, you know it's just all over the board there's tons of synergies it's a sticky minion in hunter which has always been good in the past so yeah a plus solid card for hunter so we hunters may be back at the top of the meta they've been a kind of away sleeping for a little while but looks like this could really help catapult them to the forefront because just living to call of the wild is the key right now and this is going to help you live to call of the wild next up we have barnes so this is a four mana neutral minion it's a three four and it summons a one one copy of a random minion in your deck so one of the key things to note here is it summons a copy so it doesn't pull the minion out of your deck and that's super important when you talk about death rattles and how they interact with nizoth and uh, the overall value of your deck as well if you're playing like control mirrors but mainly the most important thing is nizoth decks and what that means is in a nizoth deck if you play this and let's say the only minions in your deck are nizoth and big death rattles and you pull out one of the death rattles karen sylvanas uh Tyrion, for example any of those things get pulled out from this then when you play if you play them later on in the game or whenever you play nizoth you're going to get the full value minion back from this uh, effect so you'll be able to get like another Tyrion for example and you get some crazy things going on there and powering up the consistency of Nazoth decks a little bit and also just giving them a huge swing turn on turn four for example if you build your entire deck you, you know you got Karen, Rags, Sylvanas, Tyrion just all these big cards that are Ysera like whatever crazy things off of Barnes that just win you the game if it gets pulled out of Barnes or have like a really solid influential point on the game if you play them with Barnes then you look at your chance to have Barnes by turn four while full mulliganing for it, and you say, you do a geometric distribution, you say going first, you're going to mulligan three cards, you get three cards back, and then you draw four before turn four, and you're looking at seeing ten cards, and in the sample size, one of them's a success, the population's 30, come out to about like 33% chance to have Barnes on turn four, and if you set your deck up in a way that 100% of the time you get a crazy swing turn off of it, could potentially be quite powerful. So... Uh, I could see it being very viable in a lot of control decks that just focus on playing only minions that work well with it and then a bunch of removal that fills in those, the empty slots. I think it's going to be a very solid card overall. I think there's a lot of control decks, especially Nazoth decks, that could heavily benefit from it. I expect to see a lot of play. And even at its worst, and you look at its stats, it's going to be a 4-mana 3-4 that summons a 1-1. One, one. So that put together 3-4 plus 1-1, one, one, you get 4-5, so it's a 4-mana 4-5 kind of split into two bodies arguably a little worse when it's split into two bodies but that's not that big of a price to pay for the power potential of the effect so i think the card's very strong i think it'll see play and uh it's just increasing consistency of the nizoth decks that have been kind of under like on the bubble of being good right like we came out at the beginning of whispers of the old gods nizoth decks were dominating they were doing all sorts of work we saw chalky win dream hack austin with nizoth paladin nizoth priest and there was even Nizoth Reno Lock running around, and then suddenly people figured out the aggro lists a little bit better, and then Nizoth decks were just like 5 or 6% below the aggressive and the tempo decks. Barnes could be one of the tools that starts pulling those Nizoth decks that Blizzard really wants people to be playing. They want them to be playing the control decks. They've said uh, I, on numerous times they love control themes, and everyone loves control themes, and Reddit always wants control decks. So it, there seems to be like gearing towards to push the, that one step higher of all these slow control Nazoth decks to try and edge out those aggro decks a little bit. So this is a tool to maybe be able to do that in the earlier stages of the game. Next up we have the Curator. This is, it seems like a troll card, but trust me, I don't think it's a troll card at all. It is a 7 mana, 4 6 mech, it has taunt, and then battle cry draw a beast, a dragon, and a murloc from your deck. So at first glance you're like, who plays beast, dragon, murloc? That's 
That's ridiculous. And who who plays Beast Dragon Murloc mech decks? It's got four synergies, and it costs seven. Ah, this card's garbage. But now, break it down a little bit. If it draws two cards, so it draws a beast, which is quite reasonable to have a beast in your deck. You can look at the the array of beasts. You got like control decks, for example, can run Stampeding Kodo. You could fit Stranglethorn Tiger almost in any deck. So you got a few beast options here and there that are solid. And then you look at the dragon option, Azerdrake is one of the most played cards in Hearthstone right now. So you got that as a very powerful card that can get kind of thrown into any deck. And I'm sure there's others you can think of that are, like, okay all around. Murloc, yeah, Murloc, you're probably not going to find one that's great in a lot of decks. But if you can get this card to draw two cards, it's insane. Compare it to uh, pre lurf Pre-nerf Ancient of Lore, which was a 7-mana 5-5 five, five that drew two cards. Now, this is a 7-mana 4-6 with Taunt. Is that better than a 5-5? Five, five? It's about, you know, in equal grounds to a 5-5, five, five, if not slightly better. And you get to draw two cards. So they deemed that to be too powerful with Ancient of Lore. You have the restriction, of course, that you have to have the Beast, and you have to have the Dragon, and you have to have not drawn them yet to be able to draw from this. But if those situation aligns, if you're able to run, you know, maybe three beasts in your deck and three dragons in your deck to have the consistency of this card to be able to fire off, or maybe you just run it as a one-of and you have less beasts and less dragons. I can see this deck card being extremely competitive. Oh, I mean, you have to run it as a one-of, it's legendary. But I can see this card being extremely competitive in a lot of decks, especially Druid. You innervate this bad boy out, draw two cards, refill your hand, you're good to go. It's like innervating Ancient Allure. So I think this is a great card. I think we're going to see it have a lot of play in mid-range decks, and it's going to just increase the power of any deck that can justify running Azur Drake and Stranglethorn Tiger in the same deck, which is Druid and what other mid-range decks really? You know, like mid-range Warrior could maybe get away with something weird like that. There's just plenty of mid-range decks that could really benefit from this, like Dragon Warrior, for example. Just throw in some random beasts in there to fill out your curve a little bit. But mainly I'm going to say Druid's going to be the highlight class that's able to use this most effectively, and it's going to be pretty solid. Also, you have the potential to choose what you can get off of it, right? The only dragon you run in Freeze Mage is Alexstrasza. So the Curator then, the card text changes from Battlecry, Draw a Beast, Dragon, Murloc from your deck to Draw Alexstrasza. So you have now, you know, doubled your odds to have Alexstrasza on 9, basically, because you can naturally draw Alexstrasza, or you can draw the Curator, which then draws you Alexstrasza. Granted, the downside is you're playing your 7-mana 4-6 in Freeze Mage, but at least it has Taunt. Maybe it slows him down a little bit. But just increasing your odds of having Alexstrasza on 9 in Freeze Mage is absolutely disgusting. So that could see some play there. And as well as Malagos being a card you can select. So uh, if you're playing some OTK Malagos deck, you now have a lot more consistency in finding your Malagos for your OTK. And that comes in a bigger factor than you may think. Like, you obviously have the, the consistency of having Malagos, which is good. You have the consistency of having Malagos earlier, which is even better, because that means you have the ability to Emperor more often earlier, which makes your deck faster, which makes your kill turn faster, so you have to stall less. So this card's actually pretty sick in being able to put, pull those specific key dragons for your Freeze Mage, your OTK decks, and uh, even, like, you can pull Deathwing for survivability. There's just so many different things that this card can be set up to pull. It's such a great asset for combo decks in general, as well as also potentially being an Ancient Allure. The card is nuts. All right, next up we have Ethereal Peddler. This is a 5-mana five 5-6 five, rogue card. It has Battlecry, reduce the cost of cards in your hand from other classes by 2. So now the first thing you got to ask yourself when you look at this card is, with its stats being a 5-mana five 5-6, five, how good is that? And we can reference other cards, you know, Pit Fighter, which doesn't see any competitive play because a 5-mana five 5-6 five, is pretty mediocre, but it's almost good enough to see play Pit Fighter. Like, it's, it's on the bubble. It's one of those, like, almost reasonable to put in your deck cards. Now, how much value does the Battlecry need to get to justify playing this card? I think that if this card hits one card with its Battlecry, then it's strong enough to justify running. If it hits two... The card's performing exceptionally well in your deck and putting in a lot of work. So I think it's very close to being playable. It may even be playable. You have to dilute your deck, though, to really increase the odds of this card landing. Because Huckster is insane, so you have that already going for this card. But Huckster is not really enough to increase the consistency of this card enough to make sure that it lands. So then you have to start throwing in something like Burgle in your deck, which is a very questionable card at best. So you're diluting your deck a little bit to get the effect of this card. Is diluting your deck a bit... An 
like worth the the effect that this card brings and i think at this point the answer is no because even when you dilute your deck with double burgle double huckster this card's still a bit awkward and clunky in your hand to find uh, the time to play it. It may not be enough for this card to work, but I think if there's even just one more card that's pretty solid in the new set that revolves around rogues stealing other classes' cards, then this card can be extremely solid and would see play. So I think it's just one extra steal card away from potentially being a new rogue archetype. So I think it's very close on the bubble. It's something to watch for, not necessarily something that's guaranteed to be good. All right, next up we have Enchanted Raven. This is a 1-mana 2-2 beast, and it's for only Druid. This is just a very simple, generic, solid, all-around card. Like, 1-mana 2-2s are just pretty good. And the fact that it's a beast is what makes it really good. It, it's not crazy, though. Like, people see 1-mana 2-2 and they're like, Power creep, crazy! It's, it's not that insane. It's slightly worse than Blood to Icker, if, like, by comparison, because Blood to Icker is a 1-mana 2-2 that also does 1 damage. This you can play first is the benefit of it, and it's a beast, so it's got slightly more benefits. But overall, I think Blood to Icker is probably the better 1-drop if you're competing for the best 1-drop in the game. But uh, going first, this card's pretty nuts with the synergy with Mark of Yasiraj. Going second, it's not as good. It's a little bit uh, slower, but... Beast Druid's starting to seem like it could really become a thing. You have, you know, the Curator synergizing quite well with Beast Druid. You have Enchanted Raven trying to bring out the Beast Druid. It really looks like Blizzard's sort of pushing for this Beast Druid. And one of the things Beast Druid was lacking was its inability to fight for the board in the early stages. It was pretty good in the middle stages of the game, just pushing out consistent damage and fighting for the boards from, like, you know, 2, 3, 4 onward. And having Innervate is what made it crazy good and people bringing to tournaments in certain metas but as of late it just gets kind of beat down by zoo too fast it doesn't beat aggro shaman on board control enchanted raven may be the one drop that beast druid needs to really allow them to fight for board better against zoo against aggro shaman not make them favored in those matchups but maybe bring up the win rate enough that just beast druid becomes like a real archetype in the game so i'd expect beast druid to become an archetype as you know, from the cards that we've been seeing, and from this, honestly, this alone probably pushes Beast Druid enough to be considered an archetype. What tier it's at, you can't really say. It's not going to be tier 1 just from this card alone, right? But uh, you could definitely start seeing it appear on tier lists and being played on ladder. So I expect Beast Druid to probably be an archetype, and this card's a really great card that would go in that deck. All right, so next up we have Firelands Portal. This is a 7-mana mage card. And it reads, deal 5 damage, summon a random 5 cost minion. Seems at first that there's going to be a lot of RNG involved with this card. A lot of the 5 drops are kind of sketchy. And the, the lowest possible end, of course, you got things like Big Game Hunter. you got Validated Doomsayer, which is a lot of factors when trying to evaluate it. So overall, how does the card feel? Where is its place in the game? I'd say the card's actually pretty solid for like what you want to be doing in some constructed mage decks. Obviously, it's busted in Arena, but if you look at the constructed style here of uh, Temple Mage, Temple Mage is a deck where you originally start out playing very aggressively with minions, and then you transition into, you know, all burn spells, you go face a lot, and you try and deal as much damage as possible, and uh, close out the game there. And in that transition period, a lot of players were playing, you know, no minions, they'd just go with the, the Cabalist Tomes and the Ice Block, the Chinese version of Temple Mage. And other players, like uh, RDU, put in like Ragnaros because that's an aggressive burn spell slash minion sort of uh, as well as like Faceless Summoner and some kind of other cards in that kind of sort of slot but it's always felt like that was the weakest spot in the Temple Mage deck and now you have Firelands Portal which can kind of fill that role and help you transition from caring about the board into killing your opponent and also if you're still ahead on the board when it comes down to turn seven this card's nuts when you're ahead on the board because you get to remove a minion add a minion to the board and continue pressuring with your onboard minions as well as synergies with of course mana worm sorcerer's apprentice flame waker yada yada so the card i think is going to find a place in temple mage and be really strong how strong exactly is it going to be and that's kind of awkward to tell with you know random effects being in there so you can kind of estimate it though so uh, I did some math with some of uh, my competitive friends, and we just, uh, we came up with the, the idea that the card's actually good. And I'll just walk through some of it. So we talk about raw, raw stats. You look at all the five drops, you list out all of the, the five drops. There's like 57 of them, so it took a little while. And then you, you find the, the average attack, the average attack being 
uh, 4.14, so you round that to like four attack on average, and then the, the average health being 4.702, you round that, you know, like if, on average you're gonna get a 4.5 in stats out of this minion, just raw stats. That's not factoring any any of the abilities yet. So now the abilities, though, to factor that into your 4.5 on average stats uh, is a little more complicated. You have to estimate things. You have to estimate like uh, the situation that the minion's gonna be placed in. You gotta estimate what the effect does for mage because you're playing this card in mage most likely you got to estimate how valuable is taunts compared like taunt compared to stat or spell power compared to stats um things like halazeal being able to instantly heal you for five how much is that worth uh summoning stone pulling a seven cost minion how much is that worth so all of that stuff comes into factor i, I linked in the description my estimations on what all the effects are worth and how it comes out and how the card pans out in my estimations as well as with uh, some other players like uh, the Rat, Nostum, uh, a bunch of people, their names and everything, and all the credits are on there, so you can look at that and see uh, what we came up with for the estimations and why we think the card's good. So, coming out to it, the raw numbers here, just a sneak peek of what's on the page, the estimated mana value of a 5 drop we came to conclude is about 3.908, which it seems kind of sketchy. You're like, yeah, it's four, which makes sense with the four or five. So basically the effects all kind of balanced out at the end of the day. There's some bad, some good. And Alice is out to like, you know, an, an average four or five minion. So a four drop basically off of your five drop, you know, a four drop that you would play in your deck, which makes sense when you think about it. Like a random five drop is about as good as a four drop that you would explicitly play in your deck. So, you know, it checks out. And then you got a value on top of that, the value of 5 damage. So how important and how good is 5 damage arbitrarily? And uh, we said originally that it was going to be more like 3.25, but that's factoring into you're playing a 7 mana card that is then dealing 5 damage. But we already associated those with all the stat values of the minions, so it's more just like... 5 damage in, in general, how much is that worth, and if you just kind of factor the mage scaling and look at all the different mage spells and then evaluate from there, it comes out to like 4.25 in scale with the other mage spells. So if you add 4.25 to the 4 already, you're getting up there into the points of like 8 mana worth of value out of this card in an average situation, which is really good. Like a lot of cards in the game aren't peaking on value like that. It, it is situational though. So if you're, obviously if you're, that's not factoring an overkill. So if you factor in the overkill on the value of 5 damage, obviously the card can fall below the optimal. The optimal of, you know, dealing 5 damage to a minion, killing a minion, then 5 damage is worth 4.25 mana. So, if it's in an optimal situation, it's worth upwards of 8 mana, and if it's in a subpar situation, it's obviously worth, worth less when you're either going face with it or killing a minion that is not at 5 health that isn't a really big deal. So the situational aspect comes into it, but overall, you know, eight mana for a seven mana card in the scale of playable constructed cards is insane. I think this is a very high value card. I think it's a very good card. I think it will see play, has the potential to be used for board control. It has the potential to be used for burn, and there's nut scenarios with it. And uh, I'm gonna walk through some nut scenarios right here. So if you pull summoning stone from this card, I believe that I'm not 100% sure, but uh, I'm in agreement that it will pull a 7 cost minion off the summoning stone. I believe that's how the chain of command works in Hearthstone and how the interaction is going to go through. So you'll make your 5 cost minion of summoning stone and then summoning stone can pull a 7 cost minion. Let's say you pull Antonitis, you'll get a fireball in your hand because the same sequence sort of thing. And then if you pull... Uh, um, that might not be true. That one's less likely to be true. But if you pull Prophet Valen, it will likely do uh, double damage, dealing 10 damage. So I think that those scenarios would work out. Now, if it does work out like that, then you have actually some pretty interesting things here for the percent chance of being able to do 10 damage with this card, which can give you a lot of like lethal outs, 10 or more, because you have the Prophet Valen out off of the, uh, the Summoning Stone to hit your opponent in the face for 10, which is nuts. You have the ability to get Doom Guard for 1.75%, and that'll be in conjunction with the 5 from Firelands Portal going face. That's 10 burst right there. And then you have Leroy, which would be 11. So the actual odds of getting 10 face damage isn't incredibly low. Obviously, the Velen factor is incredibly low. That's only 0.06% to pull exactly Summoning Portal into Velen to do 10. So if you factor that in with the Leroy, with the Doomguard, 
that's two 1.75% and then a 0.06% chance, and giving you a solid total there of, you know, uh, under 4%, but above 3% to be able to rip someone for 10. So I think we're going to have a tournament at some point decided by someone's only out being Fire Lance Portal to the face for 10 damage, and they go for it, and they hit it, and the crowd goes wild. So I think it's a cool card. I think it has uh, some nut potential and not too many terrible minions and a lot of pretty average minions. So I think as far as random effects go in Hearthstone, this is going to be one of the more consistent random effects in Hearthstone. And I think consistently the card is going to be... Uh, on average for its mana cost, if not better compared to other 7 cost cards and other cards in general in Hearthstone. So I expect this card to see play in Temple Mage, I think it's going to be a good card. That's all the cards that have been released so far. So that's all I got for you guys for today. I'll be waiting to see when more cards get released and I'll make another video talking about the next set of the cards and we can really start breaking into all of the new great things from uh, One Night in Karazhan. Uh, feel free to follow this channel, follow me on Twitter. Uh, follow me on Twitch, all of them at Firebat, except YouTube is not right quite at Firebat. It's like a really long, awkward URL. So if you don't like typing that URL in or favoriting it or whatever, you can check my YouTube out by going to Firebat.tv. It just redirects to my YouTube to make it easier to type in. All right, before I end the video, I want to give a quick shout out to Yo It's Flow, Nostum, The Rat, and uh, Frozen for helping me out. We talked through the cards together before I made this video, went through over a lot of possibilities, broke down the math on some of the cards. So you can check out uh, the math in the description below the video, especially for the numbers and the estimations that we made on the portal. Obviously, people are going to be like, why did you estimate this as this? And that's the opinion of us as pro players. We came to the conclusion that, you know, taunts valued at this much mana, you know, spell powers valued at this much mana, this effect in mage and in temple mage during this time is worth this much mana. So some people may not agree with all of our estimations, and that's fine. I just wanted to present my situation of how I evaluated the card and how I think all of those manas are worth, as well as, you know, the influence from the other pro players I was speaking with about that as we made that table to come up with just an estimation of the value of the Firelands portal.